Okay, now many of my viewers were not satisfied with my brief overview of the 2024 electoral landscape for Washington State's governor race, which I uh, did last week. So they thought my video focused too much on the Democrats and didn't discuss the Republican field enough. Now, that's fair criticism, and I will try to address that critique just a little bit with today's video. And I'm likely to do a much more detailed analysis here about the governor's race landscape moving forward. So I invite you to critique this video too as well. And I, I really love the feedback, positive or negative. Both are very good, I think. So that reminds me to remind you to take just a few seconds to go below this video and to click on the like, share, and if you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, try to hit that subscribe button down there as well. All of these actions, they cost you nothing but just a few seconds. And they do theoretically help the visibility of these videos when we launch them. Recently, I've actually had some positive feedback from people who have seen these videos in their recommended video lists, which is new for us since YouTube started actively shadow banning our channel here a few years ago. So thank you and keep it up if you've been doing that in the past or start doing it now because it does seem to have an impact. So finally, I always appreciate your comments and I read them all and I respond to as many as I can. So if you wanna support us even more, you can click on the link below to support us financially as well. Your support is always appreciated. Okay, so back to the 2024 Washington State's governor race. And the reason that we're discussing this in May of 2023 is because Inslee recently officially announced he will not run again. So this has drawn attention to this race a bit earlier than normal. Now, yes, I'm fully aware that Inslee has made announcements like this before and then backtracked, but Inslee assures us that this time will be different. And while I believe very little this guy says in public, I suspect he really means it this time. So let's get on with an analysis of the Washington State's governor race. First, it is obvious why everyone is focused on this race. The top of the state ticket and the highest elected state official is always going to be a key position to watch. And to some extent, this race, or more accurately, the person likely to win this political race, they can have a major impact on the many positions uh, down the ticket as well. So even though next week is the important official filing week where every candidate who's running for political office in 2023, which is mostly city council, school board, and other municipal races, they're officially filing for office. So despite this fact, the dominant list of questions that I'm getting right now and the political rumor mill is very focused on this big question. Who's going to be running for governor next year? And then what does that political landscape look like right now? So to best understand the strategy of running for political office in Washington state, you have to understand our state has a top two jungle primary system. And then it doesn't matter if you or I don't like it. This is the way it works. So if you don't understand how the system works or why we have it, go to my video. I've linked it uh, down below, but this is the screen capture here. And uh, it's down in the description area. And see the video that I actually produced. It's a couple years old now, but it explains the history of this election policy and basically how it works. However, just keep in mind, if you don't want to understand it that well, the jungle top two primary system just means that every candidate is kind of tossed into this big pool and then during the primary election in August of 2024, only the top two vote getters are going to proceed to the general election in November period. That's just how it works. Doesn't matter what party they're from. So Washington state has lately been dominated by the Democrat party for major statewide office holders. And for the first time in pretty much over a half a century, all statewide office holders are identified as Democrats right now. And that's really just as recently as 2021. We still had one Republican, at least one Republican in statewide office. And in 2020, we actually still had two Republicans who were filling both the Secretary of State and the state treasurer positions, but not now. So in recent years, many candidates who self-identify as Republicans have really struggled to get above 45% statewide. Now, I don't want to repeat too much my discussion that, that I had last week, basically, about the two most obvious frontrunners for the Democrats who are going to be jumping into the shark pond of this race. Current State Attorney General Bob Ferguson is obvious because he's filed with the Public Disclosure Commission, and he has officially announced. Now, and additionally, it does appear certain that current Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz, will also be formally announcing shortly. Neither of these two are surprises. They both ran for governor for a few months back in 2020 until Jay Inslee fell flat on his face in his ludicrous presidential campaign and then kind of came back to our state for his consolation prize of a third term as governor in 2020. 
And as I said last week, Ferguson and Franz will be the two new F-words in the Washington political scene for pretty much the next year or so. Now, interestingly, the other strong 2020 Democrat contender at the time was current King County Executive Dow Constantine, who also backed out when Inslee came back to Washington a couple years ago. And well, it appears that Mr. Constantine, he's not going to be jumping back into the race this time. I suspect that when he was informed about how much of his dirty laundry was going to be made public to the rest of the state, he wisely decided to just keep grifting off the pocketbooks of King County taxpayers, basically, and then just continue the poor job that he's been doing there for really too many years now. Now, before I get to the Republican field, uh, sure, there are other Democrats who may actually jump in this race. Uh, State Senator Mark Mullet from the 5th Legislative District, which kind of covers the Issaquah areas of King County, uh, he's been making some rumbling and kind of lobby world uh, about this option for himself. This seems like a long shot to me. Uh, Mark is one of the very few Democrats left in Olympia who can actually do math, and he even believes that math exists as a real concept. This alone separates him from the pack. Despite the fact that we probably disagree on many things, uh, Mark here clearly is less unhinged than most of his Democrat colleagues, which is probably why Inslee tried to sabotage Senator Mark Mullet's re-election race in 2020 by endorsing his opponent. Mark actually barely scraped by to victory in the general election by just a razor-thin margin of 57 votes out of over 85,000 votes that were cast in that race. So Mullet's victory was only possible because Republicans got behind his campaign and voted for him instead of the crazy one that Inslee endorsed. So, however, despite the rumors, I just don't suspect he's going to jump in. I mean, we'll have to see. So let's talk about Republicans and what they're doing uh, to run for the governor's race. So first, let's talk about who has filed for office. And if you're actually planning to run for any political office in Washington state, you need to start reporting to Washington State's Public Disclosure Commission within two weeks of your decision or formal announcement. So because this is a high profile race, a lot of unserious people are gonna file to run for this office. And you will never hear about them because they're unserious. And how do I know they're unserious? Well, mainly because they don't raise money and they don't campaign. Pretty simple. If they prove my original estimate of them to be wrong by suddenly raising lots of money and actually campaigning, well, then I'll happily start to cover them too. And by the way, if you want to see for yourself exactly how to track this data, just go to pdc.wa.gov. you got to look here. You go to the public field then and you look at candidates. I'm kind of giving you some screenshots here. You type governor in your search field and you're going to get the same list that everybody else can see. There's no secret sauce, goes campaign for governor. You're either seriously running or you're not. So by the way, officially, none of these candidates are formally registered to run for this position until filing week in May of 2024. It's just like next week of this year is the final week for local races in Washington state, school board, city council races, et cetera. In 2024, they also have a filing week. And once again, that filing week is in May and they file the secretary of state or local auditor. And then they're officially running for office. However, in the meantime, If you're running for office, raising money, spending money, and a serious campaign, you're running a serious one, you still have to register with the Public Disclosure Commission, which is why I always use this resource just to track the status. So now, if you go to the site right now, you're going to see about 15 people who have filed for uh, office. Now, this number might change over the next few days. In fact, I'm sure it will. But at the very time that I'm filming this video, just right now, this is the list of candidates who have officially filed to run for office. And you'll note that there are a few lieutenant governor candidates listed in there, so you have to kind of take those out. But this is just because the lieutenant governor candidates still pop up in the search field when you type in governor. So six of these candidates right now, they list their party affiliation as Republican, and one of them as a constitutional party. The rest identify as part of the Washington State Democratic Party. Now, keep in mind, I'm fully aware that a host of other people are likely to file over the next few weeks and months. However, the only Republicans on this list who have raised even a penny of reported funding is actually Semi Bird out of Richland, Washington. He's currently elected to the Richland School Board. He has a campaign website. I've actually screenshot it right here, and I've linked to it down below. And he's actually out raising money, just over $50,000 so far, according to the PDC filings. And I have to tell you, I love Sammy Bird's background, and I like his story. I really do. Uh, Everyone really should love his background and his story, his military background in particular, and the service that he's given to this country, his current efforts on the Richland School Board, and I believe his story about growing up impoverished and from a single-parent household, these are all really relatable to regular people. 
Semi Bird has been campaigning around the state now for months. Now, I'm not endorsing anybody for governor, and I don't intend to for some time, if at all, but I'll tell you that I like seeing this guy running for office. Obviously, he is enormously better than any of the Democrats that could run or are running for office. The other candidate who has just recently filed for office is Raul Garcia here from the Tri-Cities. He's an ER doctor who escaped Cuba as a child and just like Sammy Bird, somebody who has a great life story to tell and who's also far better than any Democrat in this scrum. I mean, he ran for governor in the 2020 race as well as kind of a latecomer to that race. and. Well, he got bounced in the primary. He did demonstrate the ability to raise some real money. He actually raised over $400,000 in just a few months. Now, he only got 5% of the vote in the 2020 primary to finish fifth at that time. So he wasn't on the general election ballot. Over the past few years, Garcia has been traveling the state and expanding his network. So I kind of expect him to be a serious candidate at this point as well. Now, there are a few potential Republican candidates whose names have been advanced from basically from time to time. People keep talking about him. So let's review. Current Pierce County Executive Bruce Danmeyer, for example. Uh, he's uh, served in the Washington State Senate for a while. He was in the House. He was a school board member before he was even elected and reelected to the highest office in one of the most populous counties in Washington State. But he's currently term limited in Pierce County, which is where they actually do, uh, they actually limit their terms for some of their elected officials. But he has officially announced that he is not running for governor and I believe him. Another name that I hear is Lauren Culp, who lost the 2020 Washington State Governor race to Inslee. And while he could not uh, jump in, I'm really not hearing or seeing anything. I mean, he might change his mind, but I'm not seeing anything that leads me to believe that he's going to be in a realistic option right now. And it's not the least being the fact that he was bounced out in the primary race in the 4th Congressional District just last year. So this was one of the most conservative districts in the state, and that campaign just did not go well. And it was another example, of course, of Republicans kind of flooding the zone, creating just an awesome circular fire, firing squad. Now, I don't believe either former Speaker of the House, J.T. Wilcox, or Senator leader, uh, uh, Senate leader, John Braun, who's actually my state senator, I don't believe that they're likely to run for governor either. Uh, although the rumor mill's always kind of running over time and stories like this in that direction. Uh, the main reason I, a lot of these guys are just not going to run is that the governor's race, it's a very tough race for a Republican to win with everything going well, even when everything's perfect. However, it's generally believed by the Republican insiders that having Donald Trump on the ballot, which appears likely, is going to be a bad thing down ticket in Washington state. So the Democrat voters, they may not be enthusiastic about their really kind of pathetic Democrat candidates, but they're going to crawl over bo bl broken glass or do anything they can to vote against Trump in theory. And particularly if they live in Seattle, they may even vote multiple times with pretty much every ballot that they can get their hands on. Now, this just makes it tough down ticket for other races. This is kind of the political wisdom of the political class right now. It's not irrational. So most traditional candidates for state governor are just not going to be viewing the 2024 election as the one that they want to jump into. On top of this, the recent 2022 Tiffany Smiley race for federal state Senate uh, seat, which was just last year, that's really meant, that's, I would say that's really also discouraged many serious candidates from running for basically statewide office because of the final results, which were basically falling far below what the expectations were. And this had a bigger impact on the more traditional establishment candidates because she actually ran a very well-funded campaign. You can look at the FEC website yourself. It's over $20 million, according to the FEC, and she ran a very traditional launch early, which I usually advocate, line up all the endorsements you can in advance, which is also a good idea. And she still performed uh, very poorly compared to even the underfunded $3 million Cult for Governor campaign in 2020. Now, I do believe there were national issues that probably impacted the Smiley campaign and the federal Senate race a bit differently than what you'd see in a governor race. But nonetheless, this was probably the final data point which has convinced most of the Republican insider class to kind of shy away from any kind of a 2024 run. Now, another uh, challenge for the traditional Republican field is the fact that polling in Washington state has been completely useless and it's been inaccurate pretty much at every point along the way. So the traditional approach of polling seems to be just increasingly useless as a tactic for discovering if the time is right or the opportunity even exists. 
And related to this is the ineffectual and at best egregiously incompetent Republican consulting class. Hiring any of them seems to be like dooming yourself to certain failure. Republican consultants tend to be good at beating up on other Republicans and justifying their personal existence, but their track record for actually winning the race is just very, very poor. Now, another factor uh, for the Republicans running for this position is kind of this Eastern Washington versus Western Washington dynamic. Uh, Culp, Smiley, Garcia, and Sammy Byrd, they're all from Eastern Washington. And even though everyone gives lip service to campaigning in Western Washington, this seems like a cultural divide that has created very tone-deaf campaigns on the west side of the state uh, by Eastern Washington campaigns and, and candidates, really. I mean, every single time. And I, I kind of don't really get it, because keep in mind that Eastern Washington represents about 25% of the Republican vote, all 20 counties. And I've done some videos in the past that show where Republican voters are located in Western Washington, but for some reason, the math eludes the emotional approach that I see that Republican campaigns seem to take in the state. So consultants and candidates, they nod their head saying, yeah, yeah, they understand, but the, their campaigns really don't invest their time and resources into a plan that reaches out on the West Side. Now, partly this is because it is always easier to speak to your friends and friendly audiences, and why not? As a candidate, this kind of creates a feedback loop that implies that everyone you see loves you and probably boosts fundraising, et cetera, and it really feels like you're doing the busy stuff, doing the right thing. But even though the Republican establishment hated the Culp campaign, for example, uh, I thought their method of organizing well-attended rallies, mini live music concerts, and live events in the middle of the COVID lockdown world, that was better, clearly, than any of the other consultant-driven campaigns at the time. And it gave Culp the edge to kind of clear the top two hurdle for the general election. The challenge that the Culp campaign had after that was how to reach a bigger audience, particularly in the urban areas that would never attend one of his rallies. And the Culp campaign generated more state votes for a Republican than any other campaign in Washington state, but it still just wasn't enough. So what would a Republican have to do differently? And frankly, put this in perspective, it's easy for me to tell a campaign what they should do. But implementation of any successful strategy by a political campaign is just a lot more difficult than it probably appears from the outside. There's a certain amount of Stockholm Syndrome right now that kind of permeates every layer of thinking in the Republican establishment. And this doesn't make them bad people. It just means they just don't know what winning even looks like. So they can't plan for a success that they have never really experienced in modern times. So clearly a successful statewide campaign would need to have a plan to win. And any winning campaign in Washington state must plan to work in King, Snohomish, and Pierce counties very, very hard. Now, just from a math standpoint, twice as many resources and time should be invested in these three counties as a campaign puts into eastern Washington, for example, or any other rural areas that is just a geographic reality of the state that we live in. Now, I understand that we don't yet know everyone who is running for this office. People have floated Representative Jim Walsh's name out there as a Republican candidate, for example. Now, he'd be a very serious contender because he is probably one of the best known Republican politicians in the state. But unless he decides that he will take this path, there's only speculation at this point. And, but while all the candidates basically right now who decide to run, they kind of keep jumping into the early fray, let's just review key opportunities, I think, for Republicans that what they have this cycle. So despite the historic failure of most statewide Republican races in the last few decades, and yeah, some have succeeded at lower offices, but most have not. So let's review the issues that need to be overcome, and I believe the opportunities that do exist right now this cycle. First, the opportunities for political change are being created by the nearly insane policies of the Democrats in Washington state today. I mean, the highest profile clearly being the very clear pro-criminal agenda of the Democrats and the obvious destruction that this causes to the people who actually live in our state. This is particularly true for those who live in urban and kind of suburban areas of the state, those areas least likely to vote Republican. It has become increasingly clear that if you enjoy crime, violence, and you want to see more victims of crime, you will certainly vote for Democrats. And you will get this result pretty much every time now. So frankly, I don't really get this desire to destroy the cities and the communities of Washington state as such a high and enthusiastic priority for the Democrats right now, but you can't argue 
with their policies. This is what they want. Releasing criminals early simply creates more crime. Refusing to prosecute criminals, that clearly creates more crime. Encouraging a lawless environment with homeless druggie camps and sanctuary state policies, that invites more crime. Creating a safe place for Mexican drug cartels to operate selling their product will create more crime. Defunding the police and opening the prisons, that's going to create more crime. Really, only the Democrat politicians can't seem to understand this. Now, the socialists cheer it on, and then the rest of us just know that these are obvious disasters. Avoidable, preventable, purposeful disasters. So if a Republican candidate can directly connect to the lower income, the kind of the middle income population of this state, I think the ones most affected by crime, regardless of their ethnicity or geography, and, the, and they can communicate the fact that they recognize the reality of what these people are experiencing today, something that the Democrats absolutely refuse to recognize, I believe that it will go a long ways towards shifting votes in the Republican direction. And this isn't a secret or it's something new. It's not just something that I came up with. I mean, this is how Rudy Giuliani actually was elected mayor of New York, something I witnessed firsthand when I was a college student there. This was also a decisive factor in how the Republicans swept into office in Washington state in 1994. I mean, this has happened before. We've actually seen it before. History just tends to repeat itself, but nothing is inevitable. So this requires an aggressive campaign, I think, highlighting just the reality of what people in Renton and Federal Way and Kent, Burien, and yes, even Seattle, what they're living through, and then contrasting the difference between that and what they should be experiencing. Boldly contrasting the difference, really, for just all to see. Now, related to this, I believe, a strong candidate for governor has to recognize just the complete collapsing public education system in the state right now. This is where the largest portion of our ta tax dollars go. And the people of this state are not getting any kind of a return on just the vast sums of cash that are squandered in this area. And yes, I'm fully aware that we have an office of superintendent of public instruction, but the lunatics are essentially running the asylum there. And under Chris Reichdahl's destructive direction, every measurable metric is in free fall except for the bloated budget. So parents understand this. And someone has to stand up and has to be strong enough to stand up and confront the bureaucracy on this one. A Republican candidate for governor, they can connect, I think, on this issue with just a lot of dissatisfied parents and grandparents all around the state. Now, there are many other issues, and Republican candidates tend to take one of two roads essentially dealing with most of them. First, they oftentimes, unfortunately, jump into the race without really understanding the office very well. Or, more commonly, if they're serious, they study the minutia, but they fail to see the bigger picture of what they need to do as governor. And I'd rather err on the wonkish side of things, but don't get lost in the weeds. This campaign is not going to be decided on how you plan to manage transportation budget allocation policies, for example. The traditional media in Washington state is nearly useless, and it's totally corrupt now in their ability to even function as an objective reporting of anything truthful, as best I can see, particularly about a governor's race. And they will be actively working overtime to conceal everything good and amplify any minor stumble for a Republican. Nothing a Republican candidate says, no nuance they project, or policy they recommend is going to be reported honestly or accurately by the Seattle Times, the Spokesman Review, King 5 News, etc. A successful political campaign will just have to be direct to the people in a way that I don't think a Republican has ever really attempted in the past. Innovative methods of direct voter contact and communication should be the priority because the media is always going to be censoring the truth from day one. They are not your friends and they never will be. Now, we live in interesting times. Next week is finally a week, as I have mentioned before, for so many good people who are stepping up to make a difference in their communities. They deserve your support and focus right now for school board or city council. However, this governor's race will kind of hover in the background for the rest of the year as the future campaigns kind of start to come together, good or bad. So let me leave you with just a couple of suggestions for I think how you can better track what is happening out there and how you can make a difference. First, I would say watch for serious candidates. There will be more who probably file soon, I'm sure. Some good, some bad. If they can't raise money, they're not serious. If they don't completely commit to the effort, they're not serious. If they preach to the choir, they're also totally unserious. 
Number two, identify your influence network. Think of your neighbors, your family, your coworkers, people who you can influence to vote or even open their mind to voting differently than maybe how they typically vote. Word of mouth is still a very powerful tool to communicate about political campaigns. Find a way to do something about that yourself. Find a way to help. I mean, maybe hold a fundraiser for your favorite candidate, adopt a local candidate very, this year here in, for 2023, and then practice for helping them. Because whatever makes sense to you and your skill set and your passion, that can really help you in 2024. We will all have to show up to make an impact because, of course, in the end, the future belongs to those who show up.